Mike, we're starting our meeting. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The mayor has called the meeting to order. Council Member Kaplan. Here. Council Member Dela Cruz. Here. Council Member Gross. Here. Council Member Holloway. Here. Council Member Kelly. Mayor Lindsay. Here. Vice Mayor Lund. We do have a quorum. Uh, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Mia Davy, can you please help me? Come this way, please. You can come around. Just come around. Are we ready? Can you lead the pledge? Put your hand over your heart. The end of your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good job. Next item, brief comments by council. I have a couple of brief comments. I, I would like to remind all of our residents and our council members that Memorial Day is this coming Monday. We have a community program on the Village Green at 9 a.m. I urge all of you, it is a very special, very meaningful ce uh, uh, celebration and presentation. Please join our veterans, our families, and our residents. Um, it is worth your while. It will be a wonderful way to start the day. And um, it's, it's just, it's a special occasion. And I want to thank um, our residents who organize it. They do a fabulous job. And I believe it's uh, the criminal unit. Um, second, I wanted to let everyone know that we started a wellness and school program. It is a program that was started in New York City. It focuses on around healthy eating, exercise, and good habits. It was started at the K through eight last Thursday. Incredibly successful. We had 200 families sign up. We had children that were introduced to things like yoga, Zumba, kickboxing, karate. Um, they all got to eat lovely salads. It is a new initiative that we will that we have started for the schools to change the type of lunches that are available and to teach kids better habits. We are also through gracious grants from our community members through the community foundation will be replicating the program at our sister city, Liberty City, so they too will have the benefit of our wellness in school program. I also want to thank uh, Nancy Easton, who was the person who created this program in New York City, it's wildly successful. Obesity among children is actually going down, so this is evidence-based. We are thrilled to have the opportunity to replicate it here in Liberty City. So thank you, residents. Thank you. Key Biscayne Community Foundation. It's a wonderful community um, program. And, and third, the last of our citizen scientist speaker series um, event was held last Thursday. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Mortiarty. I also want to thank uh, the speakers that have come from all over the state. It is wonderful, educational. We've learned about the Bay. We've learned about um, all sorts of environmental um, impacts that we have and, and what we can do. It's an ongoing program, but the speaker series was particularly edifying. Thank you to the residents who went. We've had wonderful turnout, and we look forward to continuing it again next year. But this is something that is worthwhile that we, the foundation does and our residents um, spearhead, and we're, we're very lucky to have it, so thank you. And those are my comments. Anyone else? Next, Next item. item is the espresso presentation by Miami-Dade uh, Stroke Consortium to the Key Biscayne Fire Rescue. And Council, if I can just ask your indulgence and if we can add a very brief special presentation by our resident, Jane Torres, right after as special presentation B. And it will be on gun violence. <laughs> Yes. And Council, if I may, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jeffrey Horsmeyer, 
from the Stroke Coalition to give us an update and to be part of the presentation this evening, Doctor. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, recognize your the Key Biscayne Fire Rescue uh, Group, who's been uh, one of the big supporters of the project we've been working on. Uh, back in 1999, uh, a colleague, uh, Dr. Alex Forteza, began to bring together all the uh, uh, stroke neurologists, ER doctors, uh, stroke coordinators, and fire rescue together. We met periodically, be 50, 60 people showing up in a meeting, and uh, got a few things accomplished. Group sort of petered out. I then got involved with it again in 2011. We organized it, uh, with, uh, incorporated, became a 501c3 under auspices of FOMD. And with that organization, we have uh, uh, brought all six of the fire rescue services in Miami-Dade County together. Uh, for the first time, put them on the same pre-hospital checklist. Uh, so when they get called for a stroke alert, they gather data on the stroke patients. We then got all 14 of the stroke hospitals in town to agree to join our project and all go on to the same data gathering uh, platform called Get With The Guidelines. Uh, we then uh, brought those two databases together on what's called Get With, uh, with the Red Cap program, and with that have established the most uh, robust uh, acute stroke network in the country. I mean, we have more uh, real-time stroke data than any place else in the country. It's really become an important database. And we're partnering with Florida National University, with the uh, Med School, and with uh, biostatistics and public health and with the High Performance Database Center to manage this uh, database. Uh, since we began, uh, we started getting, uh, gathering our first data around 2011. And when we looked at the past two years' outcomes data, just from doing nothing more than, than uh, bringing more attention and visibility to stroke in the county, the uh, proportion of patients leaving the hospital with, with, with uh, little to no disability has literally doubled. And this is this is just the beginning of what we're uh, what we're uh, what we're doing. And so we wanted to thank you again for the opportunity to present to uh, Chief Osorio his crew. Chief, uh, they've been uh, huge supporters, helped us uh, design and work out implementing the uh, pre-hospital stroke database uh, for that uh, for, for gathering data in the field. And so we wanted to recognize them and thank you guys for all your hard work and and all of the. Uh, uh, the data you've been delivering to us and supporting, uh, you know, improving stroke care in the city. Thank you. And I'd just like to say a couple words. First and foremost, I want to bring up the crews that are here today. You guys can come up. I, I, need, I need to recognize them as well because they're the ones that are the ones that when you call 911 are the ones that are going to be there and within minutes are going to recognize whether you're having a stroke or not. So it's important to recognize them because they're trained professionals. That's what they do. And this award goes to them as much as me being recognized. So thank you. Thank you. Congratulations thank you. to the team. Let's go all over here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is a special presentation regarding gun violence. Hello, my name is Jane Torres and I want to thank Mayor Lindsay and the Village Council for allowing me to say a few words about uh, the organization that I'm a volunteer with. It is Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense. It's also part of every town for gun violence, which grew out of mayors uh, against illegal guns. We're a national organization, a grassroots movement, really, of mothers, fathers, grandparents, and basically everyone who cares about the safety of their loved ones. We are nonpartisan, and we are fighting for public safety measures that respect the Second Amendment and protect people from gun violence. I'll tell you what we advocate for specifically which is closing deadly loopholes in our background check system, making guns safe for children so that they will not be exposed to the risks of accidental shootings, setting reasonable limits on where, when, and how loaded guns can be carried, and creating enforceable laws that address gun trafficking and illegal guns. Today, 
I believe we will be proclaiming June 2nd National Gun Violence Awareness Day. On June 2nd, nationwide, more than 200 organizations and people of influence will ask others to join them by wearing orange to honor the lives of the more than 33,000 Americans who have been killed this past year from gun violence. You might ask why orange. It's just an interesting thing. Con uh, hunters wear orange so that they're not shot accidentally. So we have adopted it as our color. Um, and this June 2nd, we will be holding a rally in Kennedy Park. Um, Chief Press will be one of the speakers there. Uh, we're going to have other speakers and other activities. Basically, I think to show the world maybe particularly our legislators, that people in this community, people in our country, really care about preventing gun violence. So the more people that show up, the more proclamations that are made nationwide, we are hoping the more people will listen and create laws and systems that really make a difference. I have to tell you that 2016 is a turning point in our struggle with gun violence. For the first time in more than 60 years, there will be more deaths from guns than from automobile accidents. And this summer is a pivotal moment because all across the country, Republicans and Democrats will be nominating candidates for elective offices. We need them to hear our voices. And so I hope you will join me and others who are here from the organization on June 2nd in Kennedy Park wear orange and proclaim a, our need to prevent gun violence in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item, approval, deferrals, additions, deletions, substitutions, withdrawals. Mr. Manager? Mayor, if I may, I'd like to add something under the village manager's report, which I think is 9D. Um, by a request from Councilmember Gary Gross, I'd like for the police chief to uh, give a short presentation on the, his vehicles allocation and vehicles in the back parking lot at this moment. Vehicle allocation. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Yes, Mr. London. Two items. First item is to terminate discussion to terminate the public relations contract as soon as it's legally possible under our contract. And number two, to suspend our legal maneuvers against the city of Miami, the county, and to, <clears throat> to engage in active mediation to try and resolve our differences. I'm not saying terminate, I'm saying suspend and let's try to mediate, arbitrate, and get something done man to man, woman to woman, whatever it takes. That's my other item. 9A8, Schwartz Media, and 9A9, City of Miami Litigation. So that we are all clear, if he doesn't get, if we don't get a unanimous agreement on the on the um, changes, then it does not go forward, correct? Correct. Please call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is the approval of the minutes for the May 10th, 2016 regular council meeting. Move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Sorry. Motion carries. Next item is an ordinance on first reading, a capital project authorizing ordinance of the village of Key Biscayne, Florida, selecting Field Turf USA, Inc. for the installation of artificial turf on the athletic fields at the Village Green, providing for a waiver of competitive bidding, providing for authorization, and providing for an effective date. Move. Second. Thank you. Mayor, if I may. 
It is recommended that the village council direct the village manager to enter into a contract with Field Turf for the field described as Voluntary Alternative 3 in the attached Exhibit A. On April 26, 2016, the village council received the village green playing fields analysis report and directed the village manager to provide a recommended artificial surface solution for the village green playing fields. The village completed on-site meetings with four top artificial surface providers. Each provider was asked to provide an organic artificial surface solution that did not include the SBR rubber. That has recently become a point of debate due to the safety and health concerns. The village received project estimates from companies called Easy Grass slash AstroTurf, Field Turf, Sprint Turf slash CSR Construction, and Greenfield slash Burt Construction Group. The village completed site visits to the only fields that, were, that we were aware of in the South Florida area that have been constructed without SBR rubber. DAS recommendation addresses the significant concerns regarding artificial surface fields by replacing the commonly used SBR rubber infill with a cork pure fill product. In addition, by adding cool play, the second most common concern regarding the heat of the field is addressed. An independent third party laboratory has concluded that cool play lowers temperatures by approximately 35 degrees over traditional sand and rubber infill systems. The result is a field that is more expensive than the alternatives but results in the safest possible high quality field regarding requiring minimum maintenance while providing for the maximum use of the community. If I may, I'll jump in. Sure. I have been working regarding artificial surfaces for fields in the village of Key Biscayne or for village Key Biscayne use for probably five years. Um, what I have learned over the last 18 months to two years was significant concerns and echoed by this community regarding such things as SBR rubber. They were concerned about the temperature of the fields. They were concerned about the abrasion and the sock absorption of the fields. And it all came down to the type of infill that was being used. Um, as you recall, and I have stated before, the Mast Academy field has the crumb rubber black uh, infill. But the system itself, the actual design system, is pretty consistent throughout the industry, as in putting down barriers and putting down a grass mat, for lack of a better word, and then using an infill. Um, the product that I'm recommending, uh, as I said in the uh, memo, has a approximately 35 degree temperature change from ambient tension for the, some of the other fields that we've been on. Uh, the field temperature is a big concern, uh, especially with our younger children. I thought early on, and I was not clear in articulating this, we don't necessarily use the fields all during the entire sunny part of the day. Our, our young people practice on the fields after school in the afternoon and sometimes into the early evening, and that's why we put the lights on the field. But having said that, on Saturdays when we have organized sports, those games sometimes last from 9 o'clock in the morning until 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So the temperature of the field was certainly something that I was taking a look at. Um, I'm concerned um, with the uh, ability of kids that fall, the kids that play with both helmets and don't play with helmets, uh, to the concern of the shock absorption of what the fields can do for us and what they can't do for us, depending on the type of infill that we use. And finally, the infill itself. I was, in my deliberations and in my discussions with staff, I was truly trying to recognize the concerns of the community and at the same time stay away from any rubberized product that was out there. I just felt like there was enough going on. There were enough studies that were being, I won't say completed, but they were certainly in the early stages. And yet the concern was that the rubber infill was a, was a problem uh, that had been identified by media sources and things like that. All of these things, uh, as difficult as it was, all of these things were taken into consideration. And when I took a look at the four products that were part of the ones that responded back to us, I felt as though that Field Turf, I am getting that right, Field Turf was the company that I would recommend because they addressed all of these issues with products that did not have black rubber, black crumb rubber, that used the plastics from the actual field itself to be part of the encasement of the uh, organic substance. And Unfortunately, there's only one of those fields, although I did go and take a look at it. There is no track record whatsoever for that field configuration that I'm representing to you tonight, and I want to make that very clear. Um, but basically, it was, a, um, it was a decision that I made back a week and a half ago. Uh, subsequent to that, we have met with a number of the vendors. I know Council has met with a number of the vendors. And I have two things that I would, you know, I would offer. 
Number one, I think we need to get out and take a look at some of the other fields. Uh, that's not going to be a cheap route because there's just not a lot of the types of different fields here in the South Florida area. Uh, number two, I think we should use the fields that we can find. It was made a recommendation that we actually play on the fields that we're choosing to go to that type of system. And I'm in full support of that. And lastly, because this is important enough to me and I think it's important enough to the community that there not be any lag time, you have in front of you an alternative ordinance which allows for, without specifically naming a company, allows for this council to identify the fact that we have a need and to have a figure included in the ordinance that does, is not to be exceeded so that for the next month that we're off, we can continue to assess the different products that we can do the site business that we can play upon the fields. And one other item, if I may, later this evening, you're going to be agreeing to, I hope, agreeing to and allowing the manager to enter into three professional services contracts with three companies that were vetted by this council. Two of them have field turf experience, and so I will continue to use the vendors and the experts that I have at hand, inclusive of staff, to still come back to you before second reading or at second reading for any additional changes or modifications that I think are important to making sure that this project moves forward. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Let me open um, the, the ordinance door public comments. I have no speakers signed up. I'll be closing the floor. Um, Mr. De La Cruz. Um, thank you, John, for doing you know, the studies that, that I know that you and Todd have been very busy doing. And, uh, and thank you, Todd, for bringing uh, and allowing us from the council the opportunity to come and meet with uh, some of these guys to, to, to learn uh, you know, all about this uh, uh, artificial turf that uh, that we, uh, I believe, uh, have decided uh, there's no other choice to, other than to implement. Um, I do believe, though, that, like you said, uh, we, we need to do a little bit more studying before we uh, decide on, uh, on which contractor to use uh, for these fields. While the uh, field turf uh, product seems to be a very good one, uh, I think that there's uh, at least one other product that, uh, that we saw that was presented to us that, that definitely merits further discussion and further study. And, and, I, would, and I would strongly uh, uh, suggest that, uh, that you consider uh, sending Todd uh, to wherever it is that he has to go in order to inspect these fields that have actually been built by this company because I think, that's, uh, I think that, that it really merits it. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good alternative to the, to the field turf. Uh, I'm not totally convinced on, on, on the field turf. Um, I know you are, and, uh, and, I, and I understand why. Uh, but this other uh, alternative also, I think we need, we need to study it. And, and, and like you said, it, I think it's a great op opportunity to possibly, uh, well, our kids won't be able to go to New York to play, which I think is the closest place where this, this other, these other, a lot of these fields are, are, are laid. But uh, North Broward Prep, I think, has one of the other alternative fields. Um, unfortunately, they won't be able to play anywhere else other than Flamingo Park to check the field turf. Uh, but, but I think that, that Todd was talking with them in order for them to allow us to, to send our kids and, and allow them to have a, a, a day to play this. So I think, I think we're very, very, uh, we're doing this the right way. Uh, and and I, I encourage you to, to, to keep uh, doing it this way. And, um, and uh, you know, and we'll get over this, and, and it's going to be the, the right thing. Thank you. You're welcome, Councilmember Gross. Um, as um, Councilmember De La Cruz just said, I, I also appreciate your efforts, and I know you've worked very hard at it. Um, I agree that we have heard loud and clear we need to stay away from crumb rubber if we possibly can, and it appears we do have the ability to do that. However. Um, I'm really concerned about the safety of our kids and the playability of the field and the, the propensity for them to either get injured or not get injured. And I think this alternative product that we looked at that also is completely rubber free by Easy Grass after AstroTurf had, to me, two very large advantages over the uh, first one, and that is that their grass itself, their mat, was so much denser and seemed to have so much greater shock absorbency to it. And I'm not an expert on this, but you can tell by hitting it with your hand and feeling it. It's so much more 
um, spongy and springy and, 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 and forgiving than the uh, turf master was, that I think that's really important. And if they can do the same thing with a completely rubber-free application, and they use encapsulated sand, I believe, instead of encapsulated um, cork. cork. And I think the concern with sand is that it is abrasive, but when you encapsulate it in plastic, it sort of loses some of its abrasiveness. So, and they do have fields we can try. I really am hesitant to be a guinea pig. We, we, we have tried and not succeeded with these playing fields twice now, and I think the choice that we make this time has absolutely got to be the right choice. And to be the only, only the second municipality or the second field in the world, really, made out of the, the cork product, it's kind of scary to me. It really is. So if we've got a product that's been around longer, that seems to have a much better shock absorbency, and we have fields that we can see that have been used and talk to the people that have built them and used them, I would feel much more comfortable. I like your second um, ordinance uh, alternative to go out and, without naming the company as quickly as we can, make a decision which one to use but not lock into the first one until we've really investigated both. Do we have any other comments from council? Yes, Mr. London. I also had the pleasure of working with John and Todd on the selection of the uh, AstroTurf and met both suppliers, vendors. And uh, I happen to agree with Gary completely uh, that they're both good, but the problem with one is that, as John said, there's only one field and it's not in operation yet. They haven't formally accepted it. They haven't used it. Uh, so again, do we want to be a pioneer? Everybody, we got convinced. We didn't really get convinced. Some people got convinced you know, to redo the fields last time without AstroTurf, and now we're going to go ahead and, and be a pioneer again. I don't know if, as Gary said, I don't know if we can take that chance again for these fields, but both products are good products, uh, <clears throat> number one. Number two is one is a 36-ounce th fabric, and the other is a 52-ounce fabric. So the other fabric is almost 50% higher. So my question to the supplier was, so what? What's the difference? In other words, we get the same resistance either through the pad underneath it or through the turf. What's the difference how heavy it is? And basically what they said, and obviously I haven't been able to either verify it or not verify it, they said one is much more durable than the other. That was number one. Number two, uh, one product is stitched together, which is the AstroTurf and the Easy, the easy Grass that's glued together. Uh, again, not being an expert to me, normally glue which is uniform and spreads the load out over a greater area than stitching, which concentrates the load in one area, should give, again, should give you better wearability and less problems, but maybe it doesn't. But from a normal uh, material standpoint, you think it would. So therefore, again, I agree with Gary that I think we should still look further to see if the other product is really that much better, and if so, come back and make a decision. Thank you. Well, I have to say, you know, I, I uh, concur with, with my colleagues, and I do support the second ordinance. I think it, it, it's more appropriate for the point in our evaluation that we're at. Yes? It all sounds right and reasonable to me. Um, Uh-oh. I think, I think the due diligence that you've done is... Um, was very careful and thoughtful. The products that I saw, and I, I don't know that I saw... The easy grass alternative that Gary mentioned, is that the same alternative that you were speaking to, easy grass? Yes. I don't think I saw the easy grass alternative. But if you, the descriptions of that product that you've um, provided this evening uh, make me think that we should look at that product. With that said, um, I have to make a short speech because I'm not in the same place that you guys are, and I think I'd like the record to reflect the way I see this. Um, ideals about ecology and whatnot uh, aside, when we make decisions that are rooted in policy, we have to make them rooted in practicality. We can't just be um, um, overly influenced and maybe blinded by ideals and wishing that the world or products or circumstances were other than they are. So the fields failed. I think we overreacted to the second failure. 
I don't think that we reached with the kind of deliberation that is necessary for such an important decision, a, an empirical decision that grass isn't feasible. There were circumstances that I think contributed to the failure. We were briefed on them. We learned what they were. Despite our best efforts at cross-examining the experts at the time, we didn't get it right. I think part of that was because we didn't get the best possible advice, and part of it is just because it's complicated. I also remember when we faced the decision to re-up, reinvest in the turf the second time, we came to a realization that there might need to be a diminution in use to make the fields really work. When the field failed the second time, we didn't revisit that decision, and I think we should have. I would have been prepared to calculate what it would take in terms of diminished use to reinvest in the turf and see whether it couldn't work, because I don't think we came to the proper conclusion that it is just not feasible. You all disagree. Um, we need this to work. I think um, I cannot quite grasp the reality that it's this or nothing that would make it work, and I think this is a rather radical decision because I think that our ecology has always been so important to us, and I cannot quite wrap my head around such an extensive area of plastic grass. I'm not satisfied that we really um, ultimately gave full justice to the possibility of a grass. So I will vote against this, and I will expect that this will pass and move forward. And I think that the due diligence that I've seen suggests to me that the product or the products will choose between two will certainly suffice for athletics. I don't, I don't have real doubt about that. And from what I've learned about the infill material, I believe with the possible exception of ingestion or inhalation, which I still don't understand, given contact sports and, you know, falling on the surface and causing an eruption of the material that one hears is um, easily inhaled in contact sports. Um, I think that the infill materials that I've seen in your office are quite different than what we've heard about in these past two years of debate on this. And I, and I feel mitigated in my concern about it with the exception of inhalation. So that's my speech. Thank I mean, pe people and cows have been living in grass for a long time, and I'm, I don't like pivoting away from grass. Listen, the, the Village Green was um, established as a, a green community square. Um, I was at Amherst, Massachusetts a couple of weeks ago, and that's exactly what they have. And it's a passive park, and it's beautiful, and it's the center of community. That is what that was intended for. And that is what really, it's, it's, <coughs> it's ultimate use and it's idealistic use. I think our, our, we've evolved. I think um, our population has changed. I wish that we could keep it green. I wish that we, but I, I think it's not feasible. And, and it's, it's difficult. It's difficult because in an ideal world, we would have that as a public square and it would be green, and it would be beautiful, and we would have playing fields, but the reality is we, we don't have that option. So it, it's difficult. I do think that the product that was vetted is the, the cutting edge and, and healthy and appropriate and, and, and a good choice, and thank you. Ed. Uh, I don't want anybody to think for one minute that either John or Todd made the wrong decision when they made the recommendation to us. Because the Easy Grass AstroTurf people didn't recommend or submit the product that we're talking about now. So based on what they submitted, I would have gone along with what John and Todd did. And, but now that we've learned more, mm -hmm. obviously I, I feel differently. But I want you all to know that I would have done the same thing, the same recommendation that John and Todd came up with. Fair enough. Now, do we want to vote down this ordinance and replace it, or can we do a friendly well, amendment? Uh, before we do that, uh, I, I was reading the, the, the ordinance, and, and um, 
in the one, two, three, four, in the fifth whereas clause, it, um, it says that the manager recommends a particular company for the installation. And uh, then in section two, it says contractor selected. Uh, I'm not sure that that's what we want to do today. No, there's there's substitute ordinance <clears throat> that was um, did that. So I'm give you a color copy of it. Did you get? And we just leave them blank. It was blank. This yeah. Fill in for second reading. Correct. Yeah. Fill it in oh, for oh, second. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I apologize. Okay. All right. Got it. So the um, question about procedure, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that you can just um, friendly amendment. A friendly amendment to uh, and I, to adopt the substitute ordinance, uh, but you should read the title of it. I Perfect. Think. The capital project authorizing <coughs> ordinance of the village of Key Biscayne, Florida, selecting a contractor for the installation of artificial turf on the athletic fields at the village green, providing for a waiver of competitive bidding, providing for authorization, and providing for an effective date. Do we have a friendly amendment to replace the ordinance just read? Yes. With, do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Roll call? Yes, please. Council Member Gross? Yes. Councilmember Holloway? Yes. Mayor Lindsay? Yes. Vice Mayor London? Yes. Councilmember Kaplan? No. Councilmember De La Cruz? Yes. The ordinance passes on first reading. The second reading will be held on June 28th. Uh, and, and just to be clear, the reason why it's June 28th is it's a capital authorizing ordinance. And pursuant to our charter, we have to actually mail notices out to the public. So the clerk had requested that um, June 28th be for second reading. Um, also, uh, the council should know the reason why we've had to put a dollar figure in the ordinance is our charter also requires the mail notices to include a dollar figure. So. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Next. Is that not to exceed number? Correct. Not to Correct. Exceed. Correct. Yes. The not to yeah. exceed. And um, on second reading, the blanks will be filled in with the contractor selected. May I ask one question? Sure. In the specifications for easy turf, one of the items that I noticed is that the color of the field or fields is their specified color. Have we seen their specified color? Yes. Large enough? I mean, I've oh, seen the swatch, but enough, no. it's hard to know what a color is rather yeah, that's important. Why, that's why he has to go. Yeah, that's why That's why I mentioned that, that I really suggest and I encourage you know the the manager to consider sending Todd to where you know to where these fields are laid out. And you'll do that for both. You'll see the one in Palmetto Park, but you'll also go wherever you need to go to see Flamingo Park or Flamingo Park. And, and he'll bring back photographs, so we'll have things that we can look at. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Next item. <clears throat> Second reading, an ordinance of the village of Key Biscayne, Florida, authorizing the issuance of not exceeding $5,625,000 of capital improvement revenue bonds of the village of Key Biscayne, Florida, for the purpose of prepaying and refinancing a state revolving fund loan and reimbursing the village for expenditures made in connection with land acquisition for a village park, providing for a supplemental resolution setting forth the details of said bonds, authorizing the village manager to negotiate with financial institutions for purchase of the bonds and to enter into a rate lock agreement and providing for an effective date. Move. Second. Thank you. Mayor and Council, if I may, it is recommended that the Village Council authorize the issuance of a loan amount not to exceed $5,625,000 for the purpose of repaying and refinancing the outstanding Clean Water State Revolving Fund loan, reimbursing the Village for expenditures made in connection with land acquisition for a Village Park, and paying cost of issuance of the bonds. There is an opportunity to take advantage of the current prevailing low interest rates and thereby achieve debt service savings with respect to the loan and to reimburse the village for expenditures made in connection, in connection with the project. This opportunity has been presented by our financial advisor, Ms. Lourdes Abedin from Estrada Hinosa and Company. This ordinance authorizes the issuance of the bonds and the village manager to negotiate with the banks and other financial institutions to purchase the bonds and <laughs> enter into a rate lock agreement to achieve the savings. Uh, the proposals were due back on last Friday. We received them on yesterday, and I'm going to let Ms. Abedin explain the uh, the process and more importantly the fact that we have an even less interest rate than we presented to you on first reading. Ms. Abedin, if you could please come to the podium. Is less the right word? 
Good evening, Mayor Lindsay, council members. I am very pleased to be here before you today. Um, we the village received 13 proposals from eight banks, uh, and I'm happy to report that all the rates that came in were lower than the ones that um, were presented to you at the first reading of the ordinance. Um, the leading bank right now looks like it's going to be Florida Community Bank at a rate of 1.97% for a 14-year loan, fixed rate, no prepayment penalties. They had a couple of uh, additional conditions on their proposal, such as a accelerated provision for payment default, which I have negotiated away from and they have agreed, but there's still other negotiations to be had. Um, the second runner-up would be Pinnacle Public Finance at a rate of 2.15%. So if you vote for this ordinance today, I will assist the manager and the finance director to um, move forward with negotiations with those two banks. I will, number one, and if that fails, then number two. Currently, if Florida Community Bank is selected. The savings are now $375,000 versus the originally um, projected $161,000. And if we have to go with Pinnacle Public Finance, the savings would be $325,000. That's for the remaining term of the loan? Correct. 14 years? Correct. Mr. London. I previously voted to borrow the five point some million dollars, <laughs> including the two million dollars for the purchase of the uh, pocket park. Uh, on further thought, with the approximately thirty million dollars we have in the bank and we haven't been spending it, it's probably even though it's a great rate and you did a great job, and I wish we all could get that rate. Uh, I would at this point think that we shouldn't borrow the extra two million dollars since we have so much money sitting around that it'll be quite some years probably before we use the money we have. I mean, even though it's only 2% or 1.9 something, uh, that's still 2% on 2 million, which is $40,000 a year. So if it takes us five years to spend the 30 million that we have, that's $200,000 that we've wasted. And we're, I shouldn't say wasted, that we'd have to get that much lower of a rate going forward to make it equal. So my, my suggestion is we consider accepting a loan with Florida Community Bank, but less than $2 million, if that's possible. Mr. Gross? Um, I, I totally agree with that because, to me, the notion of reimbursing ourselves for money that we already spent, it doesn't make any sense. When you change pockets with money, it's still your money, and I think that it makes a lot of sense to borrow money if we have a specific use for it and we don't have the cash to pay <clears throat> out of pocket. But to simply borrow money because we can and incur an interest cost on money that we don't have a specific use for right now and knowing that we have the ability to borrow that money in the future if and when we need it, um, there's a reason to refinance to reduce our interest rate, but I can't see any reason at all to borrow money that we don't need so we can put it in the bank earning nothing and pay interest on the loan. However, there's one more alternative, and I just want to throw this out. We do have a significant amount of money in the bank, and even at this new interest rate, the payments on this are going to be, I just calculated, at about $81,000 per million per year. And we could save all the interest entirely if we simply paid the loan off. It's an alternative. We have the money sitting in the bank, earning nothing. If we paid the loan off, then we would be saving the interest on the loan, whether it's refinanced or at its current rate, which could be a significant amount of money. And if and when we really have the use for this money for capital projects, we still have the ability to borrow the full $48 million of our additional borrowing power, which is going up every single year because our ad valorem tax base is going up every single year. Now, it's true that we run a risk that if we borrow money in the future, it might be at a higher interest rate. However, <clears throat> excuse me, at what point do you calculate the savings of all those years that you haven't paid interest in exchange for paying a higher interest rate at some point down the road when you actually do need to borrow the money and start paying interest? 
I don't have a crystal ball, and I can't answer that question. But I think it's an alternative that we ought to consider. Mr. Paying the loan off instead of refinancing it. That, that was my position the first time we talked about this. And, and I'm glad you guys have come, ar come around. Um, um, We're slow. I, 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 <laughs> I'm also wondering, I mean, do we have other loans that are higher interest rate that we could prepay? No. Okay, so then, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not in favor of, of spending $40,000 a month, I mean, a year, a month, a year on, on, on money that we are not going to spend. And we have plenty in the bank, so even if we needed it to spend for something else, we could always borrow hmm. at that time and, and, and save the 40000 um, Theo. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I agree that financially uh, having, having money in the bank not earning interest is not uh, the best use of it. However, uh, having witnessed a number of large and sometimes debatable capital projects, uh, having the money available in any regard makes that much more palatable. Um, the prospect of having to go out to borrow to get a project done in many, in some cases is adds an additional burden that can be used as a, as a kill pill. And so for me, the, the prospect of spending $40,000 to have the cash on hand, even though it's, you know, Five million dollars is a lot of money, but in comparison to what our tax base is, it's it's a it's a fraction. So I, you know, I, I think I agree that you know if we've got two million maybe for the, the park that we we don't. But I the idea of paying down our debt just so that we save that forty thousand, I I don't I won't I don't agree with. Mr. Kaplan, I would. Um exceed to not borrowing the extra two million if we can still get this rate and get this deal and refinance the um, stormwater or the sanitary sewer financing. I think it's important that we have ample surpluses. We've had this debate for years. There are occasions where we've missed strategic opportunities because we haven't been able to marshal the fifth vote on financing. And, uh, you know, I still think about one of those deals with an enormous amount of regret. The deal, the acquisition was approved by a majority of the council, and the deal failed because a fifth vote couldn't be garnered for the financing, and we missed a strategic opportunity. Uh, I don't like things that are that important to teeter-totter on transitory politics. And so surpluses, I think we have all at times, some of us regularly and uniformly come to see as, as a very, as a blessing. So I'd, I'd refinance the um, sanitary sewer. I'm fine not paying us back on the two million. We don't need to do that. Um, but I would, I would keep our powder dry for other deals when, we, when they come up. One more comment, if I may. Sure. Um, I, I totally agree that that's a very viable alternative. Um, I just wanted to throw out the concept of we could repay it if we wanted to. Having said that, I firmly believe that once we get our capital project agenda really lined up and really understand what we're going to be doing over the next few years and how much money it's going to cost us to do the things that we hopefully are going to decide to do, we're going to have to go out and float a major bond issue to get these things done. I mean, you talk about underground utilities, for example, and we've heard figures of $60 million to do underground utilities. Whatever How it is. How much? $60 million. No, no. Hmm? 16, whole 17 million for the, the whole, whole island. For the whole island. Million, that's it. Oh, it's assuming they get, they, the, we don't have to buy the easements, right? Well, that's East. all in. I don't yeah. know. No, that was the number yeah. that one of our planners threw no. out. Right. No. May no. Not be right. no. And we have to buy the easements. Right. That's not unreasonable. <laughs> the point is, I'm not talking Someone's about messing with you. I'm not talking about <laughs> underground utilities. I'm adding up all of the various things that we have on our plate. And regardless of what each individual one will cost, it could be a significant amount of money. 
And if we go out and float a major bond issue, the, 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 the likelihood is, is that we will roll any existing loans into that anyway and get it all taken care of. So I think, um, I think that the plan that we're probably going to come up with in, in the not too distant future is going to far exceed the money we have in the bank. So I'm fine with going ahead and refinancing short term. Just understand that we probably have to have that loan outstanding for somewhere between four and five years in order to recapture the loan costs incurred in refinancing it. So if we feel comfortable it is going to be outstanding for four to five years at least, it makes sense. If we think that it may not, maybe it doesn't make sense. I'm just throwing that out. Yeah. How, how much is period? It? Sorry, will be three years. Three. Mm -hmm. Well, on the new interest rate, it'll be less than it was on your original. I think two point four percent. Correct. Right. Mr. London. Lourdes, I think we discussed the high rate financing we have, and they have prepayment penalties on those. The four point some percent. Mm -hmm. So those we can't prepay under any event. Uh, but the other ones that we can prepay, Gary, are, they're much lower interest rates. So right now, I, our, our debt is, what, about a million dollars a year in interest, approximately? Approximately. About a million dollars in interest. We earn probably a good $20,000 in interest to offset that. So we have a negative arbitrage, close to a million dollars, which we can't get rid of altogether if we wanted to because of the four point some percent debt. Uh, three and a half years ago when I first sat here, I thought, my God, we're really going to do all these capital projects. It's all going to get done, and all this money we have in the bank is going to be used. Well, three and a half years later, we still got the money in the bank. We have very few capital projects completed that required a lot of money. So my feeling when Gary suggests paying it off, I understand where he's coming from. If we all say to ourselves, hey, we're really going to do something, we're going to spend money, get the capital projects done, then fine, I have no problem. But if we continue to do what has been done since I've been on the council for three and a half years, then it makes absolutely no sense not to pay off all our debt that we can. What, well, what? I, a couple of things. Uh, there are benefits to having uh, money on hand and having, uh, it certainly helps your credit rating. Well, put and we are, and we are in fact, we are in fact doing capital projects. I didn't say we were. them up. Um, and also just because I'm thinking of debt that's coming uh, that's in the horizon, where are we with the last tranche of the school debt, and how much is that, and when would we have to borrow, or are we going to pay it off? Just in terms of if, if we're going to be strategic, let's... Um. Um, the last tranche is due when the project is completed. I would have to leave it to the manager to tell me if that project has been completed or not, and the amount would be $2.5 million. The school board is diligently inquiring about where that money is. They're end of their fiscal year is June 30th, and of course they would like to be able to account for it prior to the end of their fiscal year. So manager, can we please have a report in the next couple of days whether the school board has fulfilled their responsibilities in terms of um, students and the number of enrollment stations and the rest of the terms of our contract just to kind of get a better idea. When's the next meeting? Madam Clerk? June 14th. We are We're going to change that. I, of course we well, I have a meeting with the school board on June 13th, and so okay. I'll be able to report back if, hopefully, I'll be able to report back. Fair enough. Thank you. Mr. De La Cruz. What, what is the prepayment penalty on that four-point something uh, uh, loan? Do you know? It's a make-hope provision. I'm sorry? Uh, it's called a make whole provision. Right. Basically what it means is that there's no way that you can lower the Right, that you interest. can get, get, take advantage of any savings from repayments. You have to pay the whole yield. Yep. You would have to pay the whole, yeah. And An hour it. later. Right. Unless you could get them to reinvest the money in somewhere else. There are other opportunities for savings now that we've seen these rates and some of the loans that you have outstanding. However, I would have to do the calculations because we never recommend savings. We always recommend that you save enough to make it worth refinancing. How many more years are left on that other loan on the four on the four point? Uh, and I, I 2020. 2020? 
final so four years. So we have four more years. That's fifteen uh, percent. There's another one. Twenty twenty two. And they both have the same prepayment issue. And one five percent. The other one is at four point zero five percent. Okay. So, um, you know, is the friendly amendment, which I'm happy to make, to uh, pin this bond refinancing to roughly three point six? I don't have a problem, but this council had taken a vote to borrow the monies to reimburse the land acquisition. Um, the amount that was fund. presented during the first hearing, first reading was. 3.5 million, and then the 2.1 was added to it, and that's how we got what we got. Right. The first one was 3.5. Again, it was just because that's what we had committed to as a council. That was right. the vote that was taken. I, I don't have a problem either way. I'm happy to support it. I, I don't think, uh, I think the rationale is sound and sensible, and mm -hmm. I don't think it matters. So you're amending the thing? What are we doing now? I'm suggesting that we borrow 3.6, roughly, whatever it is, you know, to include the financing to costs. To refinance the state revolving fund loan, right. which is what will generate your three hundred and seventy twenty-five to $75,000 savings. Right. Cool. So. Do I have a second on that friendly amendment? Second. <laughs> Call the question. As amended on first reading, Mayor Lindsay? Yes. Second. Vice Mayor London? Yes. Councilmember Kaplan? Yes. Councilmember De La Cruz? Yes. Councilmember Gross? Yes. Councilmember Holloway? Yes. The um, ordinance is adopted on second reading. Correct. Just to correct the record, um, this was second reading, not first reading. Second reading. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Thank Next you. item, so I will come back to you at the June 14th meeting with a resolution with the final terms of the law. Thank you, Ms. Abedin. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Next item is a capital project authorizing resolution of the Village Council of the Village of Key Biscayne, Florida, selecting the bid of Lead Construction Group, LLC, for the construction of the Calusa Park Trail project, authorizing the Village Manager to execute the contract and related documents for such project, providing for implementation and providing for an effective date. Moved. Mayor and Council, if I may, it is recommended Second. the Village. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. The second. Second. Thank you. My fault. It is recommended that the Village Council approve the attached resolution authorizing the manager to execute an agreement with Lead Construction Group LLC as attached as Exhibit A for the second and final phase of the Calusa Park Golf Cart Path project in an amount not to exceed $56,600. Funding for this project is in the FY 2016 or 2016 Capital Improvement Plan. This project was originally identified in the, 2000, or the 2020 Vision Plan and detailed in the golf cart master plan. The first phase was completed in January of 2015 and consisted of a nine foot wide pathway composed of brick pavers. The path begins at the roundabout at the intersection of Harbor Drive and Fernwood Road to Calusa Park between St. Agnes's Catholic Church and the Harbor Plaza Shopping Center. The second phase will extend the pathway to the Calusa Park parking lot. The village was required to enter into an agreement with Miami-Dade County, granting permission to extend the path, as you see in Exhibit B. The path consists of a 10-foot wide pathway composed of lime rock bordered with wood planks. These materials were selected due to the environmental nature of Calusa Park. In essence, we're just finishing up the project, a little bit of a different surface. Quick question. We had five bids. What was the range um, for the line of, the, of, the, of the bidders? The proposals. Good evening, Council and, and Mayor. The uh, second bid was 62037 The third bid was 62341 fourth one, 67290 And for some reason, the fifth bid was 119300 They really wanted the job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Judd. I was just wondering because it was competitive bidding. <laughs> discussion? I'd like to open this up for discussion. Yes. Going back to the 2020 vision work, um, it's it's funny, you know, Ed's comment earlier about how difficult or how protracted some capital projects can be. 
this was one of the great ideas in 2005. And it's obviously taken quite a long time. 11 years? The um, initial pathway, I think, is very nice. I think it's the kind of improvement that we hoped it would be in 2005. I don't know why it took quite so long to realize that first phase of this. Uh, I've observed with Judd a, a small measure of disappointment on my own part that the desired improvements in Calusa Park itself haven't been able to proceed as we hoped in 2005. So the question is, is this still a worthwhile project? I think it is. And I think that for all of the good reasons that we aspired to be better connected with Calusa Park when we were doing 2020, um, since then we've learned that Calusa Park is actually very well used. Uh, we don't, I personally don't have that much opportunity to experience that because um, I don't play tennis there, but other people do, a lot of people do, uh, and parties and whatnot and the like. And so we should do this for lots of reasons. One of them is that, you know, for the whole bundle of good idea reasons that caused us to have this ambition in the first place, and second, to encourage the kind of improvements in Calusa Park that we've been trying to drive for years. And third, you know, it still is true that people are going into Calusa, and this is a more safe path than having to go out onto Crandon and come back around and get there the way that's been required all these years. So I think we should do this. Absolutely. It connects us to, to Calusa, and I have to say, just for clarification, one of the reasons it took so long is was because it was out of our uh, jurisdiction and, and we had to negotiate diligently to make improvements, which is crazy, but that is how it works. So so it wasn't for the lack of, of, of trying or of Looking being... at me. <laughs> because it, it's crazy that it took that long. I, I recognize that. Oh, yeah, and I and we don't move, we generally don't move that slowly, but we had, you know, based, partners. Based on this, the underground utility should be buried by the time I'm 100? By the time you're buried. If it by took the, 11 years <laughs> for a path, I got 24 years to go to be 100. Thank you, Bidney. We should have the underground utility. Yes, we should. Great. Yes, yes. Well, we'll have, I'll keep uh, alive just to make sure. Please do. Mr. De La Cruz. I happen to use this path Every week, so I, I think it's a I think it's a great idea, uh, and I th I don't think we should stop there. Uh, I think uh, we should uh, do everything we possibly can to continue that path all the way to the tennis center. And that is the goal. And that is what was but, I, but identified. It's let, the goal. Let's start talking about it now. Let, let's start talking to the right people and 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 move forward with with that. That that would be a magnificent uh, you know project. Uh, to go. We had um, some encouraging conversations in 2012, 2013. Uh, my county Parks thinks this is a great idea. We need, we need um, the amendment committee to yeah. think it's a great idea yeah. as well. Almost everybody who studied the plans from our 2020 work understand what this could be. It could connect to the golf course. It could be, you know, connect to that view area off the 18th fairway. I think the, even Mr. Matheson would, uh, you know, uh, would, would, would come up with, <laughs> mm. that, with that. You would think. I think so. I, I, no, no, I really think so. I, I, um, and, you know, we should uh, explore it. We will continue to explore it. It's, it's push, Let's vote you know, on if, you, if at first you don't succeed, then try, try again. But it's, it's, uh. it's work in progress. Please call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Next item is a resolution of the Village Council of the Village of Key Biscayne, Florida, selecting Calvin Giordano and Associates, Inc., the Cordino Group, and EAC Consulting, Inc., for continuing professional services, providing for authorization, and providing for an effective date. So moved. Second. Mayor and Council, if I may, it is recommended that the Council select Calvin Giordano and Associates. The Cordino Group and EAC Consulting Inc. as the Village's consultants for continuing professional services and authorize the manager to execute an agreement with each firm. On April 26, 2016, the Village Council heard presentations from the shortlisted firms and ranked Calvin, Cordino, and EAC as the most qualified firms for professional services and authorized the Village Manager to enter into negotiations with each of the firms. The three, three firms selected will provide professional services for the following disciplines. General Civil Engineering, Transportation Planning and Engineering, Environmental Engineering, and Landscape Architecture. 
attached as Exhibit A are the negotiated hourly rates for each of the three firms. Thank you. I, I first want to um, thank the manager and staff for making this happen. This process was much needed. It was something that was impairing our, our capital improvement projects from going forward. We have fabulous um, consultants to work with now, and, and I thank you, manager, for, for taking this and, and, and putting this process forward. Um, it's a good step forward. Do we have any discussion? Call the question, please. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution is approved. Next item is a mayor and council reports and recommendation discussion on the following proposed resolution, a resolution of the village council of the village of Key Biscayne, Florida, adopting revised special rules of order for meetings of the village council repealing resolution 99-21 and prior resolutions on the same subject matter and providing for an effective date. Council member Kaplan. Uh, yes, we've discussed this a lot. The reason that I ask that this be brought for discussion as opposed to action is because I, I don't believe we've discussed the changes that were requested the last time we had a substantive discussion. And so to give an opportunity to see whether everybody's cool with what I've done in response to the input the last time, here it is. Um, the elements that were changed had to do with the proposition that non-agenda items could be brought forward, not only if it was an emergency to do so, but if it was a time-sensitive item and if we, if a majority of us recognized it as such. And the other, the other element was really um, the experience that I had last Tuesday night, uh, or the last meeting, trying to deal with being remote and participate. Um, and so this attempt to articulate the notion that council might ordain standards for remote participation when people are unable to be physically present but still wish to participate, which they should because it's our duty to do so, uh, is an open question as to how, you know, what methodology or how. But I can tell you la there was a glitch last week. It didn't work. Um, one of the guys from IT texted me during the meeting to say, sorry, we're having trouble. Uh, clearly it wasn't working. So nothing's infallible but there are devices uh, some of which we employ in our businesses mm -hmm. so um, but that that's it you know the 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 gist of this is still that there are occasions when people can't be here and you know we try to accommodate participation in the fullest way possible but the methodology to make it seamless and non-interruptive for those of us that are here is what this additional text tries to speak to Fair enough. Mr. Dela Cruz. Did, did we resolve the, uh, the glitch? The glitch? Which, uh... Yes, we believe that we did because we had, it was working fine here, but it was the outward bound. And they were on it during the, during the discussion. They got it fixed very late in the discussion. And right. We'll get back to you. Right. Uh, but I'm not happy with the service and with where we're at. This is probably, and we just, you know, say it, it's about the fifth time. When people from outside, not within the community, Kelly Josephson, for example, yes, it's about the fifth time that we just think it's fixed. They tell us it's fixed. We run the test, and then the night that it's needed is un unacceptable. Yeah, I was, I was surprised. I mean, we have the new, our new, right, you know, HD <laughs> uh, system. It was a surprise when the, the reception that I got was surprising. Yeah, this, you know, I mean, the, the state of the art is much better than that. You know, I think we need to make it work. Uh, you know, I. Uh, With you. Yeah. Why don't we add that to discussion item for our next meeting? Because I think it, we need to have a bigger conversation than this, but it's not appropriate. I will add. Thank you. So, so what's left in this text on satellite participation is non-prescriptive, but leaves it to us to develop whatever we think is the right methodology. Our methodology is plural. That's it. Fair enough. And I think our discussion was, again, that we voluntarily commit to, to serve on council, one of the few responsibilities we have is to be present, but things happen. And so it's not a, a way out, but it is something that is sometimes a, a, a needed assist. I think, and remember the language here is not um, a hall pass. The language here Correct. reinforces the notion that it is our responsibility to be here. I think it's properly articulated. 
So, you know, in my opinion, uh, this is ready for action, but I brought it for discussion because there's new text. And Mr. Kaplan, if you'd like to put it on for resolution, I support it. And then next time. We seem to have, yes, thank you. Next item proposed changes to the 2016 council meeting schedule. Council Member Gross. Same topic, different date. Um, we have a meeting on our agenda, which is for July 5th. Obviously, that's the day after July 4th. You're good. And the reason I'm told that we put that meeting there is because we had an understanding that we had to adopt our millage rate between the dates of July 1st and July 10th. We've come to find out from our village attorney that that's not the case and that we can approve our millage rate basically at any meeting, any regularly scheduled meeting that we want to. And because of the um, awkward timing being after the 4th of July holiday, I would recommend that we not have that meeting if that's the primary reason we had it. Which is this community's most important national holiday, I'd like to add, and we might not uh be up to snuff on the fifth. <laughs> I would say there's a high <laughs> likelihood that that would be the case. <laughs> Absolutely. Now we we voted to approve um, our meeting schedule at the beginning of the year. We'd like to amend it. Is there anything we need to do? Can we just strike the meeting? Yes, you can. You can strike the meeting. I don't believe you adopt it by resolution. Uh, I believe it's just by just motion. By no, motion. it's just by consensus. by consensus. Would you like so to? By a motion, you can do it. Make a motion. I would. Um, the question is, do we want there to be any other meetings on this schedule that we might want to remove? This and I, I say that for a reason, and I don't want to make a speech, but when, when we first incorporated and we had our first council form, um, according to our charter, we're supposed to have a minimum of 11 meetings per year. 11 regularly scheduled meetings. Back then, in those days, and for many, many years after that, um, we had a lot of zoning issues, and those zoning issues were taking up a significant amount of time at those regularly scheduled meetings. So at some point in time, uh, it was decided that there would be scheduled zoning meetings to hear only zoning issues. And whenever there weren't zoning issues, those zoning meetings would not take place. Somehow or another, <laughs> With the passage of time, those zoning meetings morphed into regular business meetings as the zoning issues became fewer and fewer, and we really didn't have very many of them. We still continue to have zoning meetings scheduled every single month, but they're really called zoning meetings. They're not zoning meetings. They're regular business meetings. There are a lot of communities that function on one business meeting a month, and we used to, and those were back in the days when we had a lot of stuff that we had to get done. So I suggest that we try to work our way back towards the way we used to be, run our meetings very efficiently, try to have one meeting a month, and if in fact there's a reason to have another meeting in any given month, we have the ability with short notice to call a special meeting at any time it's necessary. But to schedule two meetings a month, on top of that, all these workshops that we have to be at because they're very important, I don't see the reason in it. I, I think that when we, we could have as many meetings as we want, still continue to have three and four hour meetings, or we could have one meeting a month and have all our business conducted very efficiently. So I would like to remove one other meeting, having said that. From I propose that we put our budget workshop for June 28th and we strike the June 21st meeting, if anyone has a problem with that. Can we strike the June 14th meeting instead? I think we have something on the agenda for the. Do we have anything? Uh, I, I was on the the June twenty eighth meeting is, is where we announce the second reading of the uh, Art artificial Fish. turf. Yeah. So could, could we possibly move the fourteenth instead? So let's cancel. That's a, that's a very selfish request, only right because now? I'm not going to be here, you know, and and I really like being here. So you know, I mean, if if it doesn't mean it much to anybody else, then I would ask that that meeting be the one that was. It's okay with me. So, so there's a motion to remove. I won't be here at the 21st meeting. I'll be here at the 14th meeting. <laughs> That's being selfish. Okay. 
There's a motion to remove the June 14 meeting and the July 5th meeting. I, I need a second. Uh, it's the 14th. June 14th. Ed's, Ed, you won't be here on the 21st, but I won't, I won't, Luis won't be here on the on the 14th. So it's whatever you guys want to do. Um, I'd, I'd rather strike the 14th if possible. Well, there you go. Strike the 14th. Sorry, Ed. No, no. no problem. You can call in. From England. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right, so I'll move it. Um, we strike the 14th and the and the 5th of July. We need a second. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item. Gun Violence Proclamation, Mayor Lindsay. The, the tab had information to follow. And we had a draft, but it didn't make it. We didn't have our clerk in. So you want my apologies to, the to next? Well, I, I think we want to do it by June 2nd. So what if I, I would ask is, and, and as explanation to this, um, our, our, our Mayor Kaplan, started this initiative several years ago uh, when he uh, did a proclamation and, and signed on to be one of the mayors to um, really address gun violence on a national level. And so this is something that has been very important, is something that is needed. As you all know, in this county, we have too many children dying from gun violence on a regular basis. And the idea was, and as, as our resident, um, Ms. Torres, was so eloquently explained, is it's not about a partisan issue. It's not about the Second Amendment. It is simply about addressing good, sound policies to deal with it, the, the stemming back the, the gun violence and the illegal trade of guns and how they're put on the street. So um, I think this is the natural progression again. It's not political, it's a responsible thing to do. So um, thank you, uh, Mr. Kaplan, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for drafting this next uh, proclamation, which was beautiful, I'm sorry it didn't make the record. What I would ask is, and, and I can go ahead and sign it as mayor, but I want an explanation. I wanted Ms. Torres to have the opportunity to explain and, and to invite people to the, the June 2nd event and I thank you for your leadership. Um, and, and also to thank you, Frank, because you made us aware of this and it's very important. Thank you, Myra. Thank you. One, thank one you. question on the proclamation. Uh, we had spoken at some point about disseminating our proclamation to other local mayors that have signed up for the national organization. And I... Uh, I think I committed to do that if we have a proclamation. So I can do that in advance of June 2nd, or you can do it either way. But uh, if we're going to do it, we need a proclamation. Well, I'll tell you what, we will have a proclamation tomorrow. You should have a draft. And uh, we will circulate it for our, our council members. But uh, you'll have it tomorrow. And please do me the honor of distributing it because it is your, your baby. We'll get it out. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Next item, update on Virginia Key litigation, Mayor Lindsay. Um, as you all know, uh, just a quick update for residents and, and, and for council members. We have had a flurry of activity from the city of Miami. Um, a couple of desperate uh, motions and, and, and writs and all sorts of things have been filed. That continues. Um, also, adjacent to the Marine Stadium property, there is... Um, there are some real issues with the RFP that was um, done for the expansion of the marina. The different bidders have um, filed um, complaints trying to throw out the, the bidding process. And uh, so that continues. And again, it's part of the bigger picture of what's happening in Virginia Key. We do have tonight, the advisory board is meeting to and this is the Virginia Key Advisory Board that was appointed by, we, we have a, a, a representative on the, on, the, on the board 
but this is something that was formed by the city of Miami for the different stakeholders to participate. They have their work cut out for them. They're probably working right now just to give an update. And there is some activity uh, where the landfill was where they need to, re to, to cap. But my understanding is that there have been a couple of unsolicited bids and the city of Miami is uh, working in all sorts of directions. So just to give everyone an overview. That, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Next item, safety of pedestrian crossing on Crandon Boulevard. Mayor Lindsay. Uh, yes, I, I, this was in response to a couple of calls that I got last week. Uh, we have a unprecedented number of children walking and riding their bikes to school. Unfortunate last week, a boy was crossing at a Crandon, was on a bike on a Crandon sidewalk and there was a middle-aged man texting and driving uh, in the morning through the intersection, through the crosswalk, struck the boy. Fortunately, he was not hurt. But I'll tell you, grown people, adults are texting and driving. It's outrageous. And I, it's just completely unacceptable. Um, I know that we have a safe routes to school that addresses these issues. Uh, we are really, we've studied the safety we will be implementing, but in the meantime, Chief Press has informed me that they will be putting a flashing crosswalk up there in, in two weeks. And I thank you all. I know that residents are not, you know, are, are at odds with the flashing crosswalks, but when we have children being struck by distracted drivers, unfortunately, we need flashers. I mean, it is, it is outrageous. It is outrageous. So I know also Chief Press and our police department has been out at that intersection um, educating drivers um, as to what their responsibilities are and to please be careful for pedestrians. We appreciate your presence there. Unfortunately, we do need some education at some of those crosswalks. Thank you for being there. I've gotten calls the parents appreciated. The kids are feeling safe again. And, and just fair warning to a residents, please be careful. Please be careful. These are children's lives. These are people should be able to walk safely and cross the street. It's unacceptable. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the issue in this particular crosswalk and another one down the street is that, it, you know, it invites people to, to cross there. And there's little signs that sort of, uh, you know, tell you that this is where you're supposed to cross. Unfortunately, it's not enough. It's not enough for the cars, you know, and that's why we had to do what we had to do. And the, the one that's right across from the from the village green. Absolutely. You know, and and uh, and if we're going to keep that as a quote unquote crosswalk, we got to do more there. We, we can't, we, you know, because if not, there's going to be an accident. Well, there. we are. We're putting yeah. flashers there. there there's, there's definitely going to be something happening there. And I think the chief agrees with me. So uh, uh, we have to do more at, at this one and maybe another one down down the block uh, because we can't expect the police to to be able to resolve that issue if there's not the proper signage and the and the and the and the reliance upon you know the, the the traffic stoppage that needs to happen whenever somebody is at the crosswalk. Mr. Dela Cruz, we will be putting flashing lights there right. uh, in two weeks, and that should you know they're pretty bold. It should it should really help the idea. But right. I also I'm just I'm just concerned that that it not be done, you know, piecemeal. That that we we should look at all of Crandon, you know, and uh, and. Uh, you know, decide on when we where we should do it and do it all at once and, and get it done. You know, Chief, I, if you could please address us. I know that you've been working on a plan for a year and a half, and we're we are at that. Please address yeah, us. And uh, excuse my voice, I'm a little under the weather, but uh, we've been working with our public works superintendent to uh, get approval from the county to do simply one intersection at a time. Uh, now there's there's. There's certain things going on with our pedestrian uh, crosswalks. We have multiple crosswalks here that some are very close to each other. So you can't always put flashers at every crosswalk because we've had this discussion many times in our staff meetings to try and determine which is probably the most dangerous, which really requires the lighting 
which we can get away from, which intersections we can live with with signage, but probably more obvious signage, um, along with education, along with enforcement. And we've also had this discussion with the manager about eliminating some pedestrian crosswalks and, you know, trying to encourage people to move to the ones that are Safe. highly visible and, and safer for them to cross. So it's, it's a multifaceted approach. Um, Tony Brown has assured me there's going to be shovels in the ground in two weeks. It doesn't mean that the signs will be up. It'll take a couple weeks once they dig, uh, but they are coming, uh, the electric flashers. And then post that, we will be dealing with uh, each other intersection that we feel, A, we should keep, and B, have that discussion on which ones we feel are dangerous and we don't need. We don't need to have a pedestrian yeah. crosswalk every 100 feet. You know, um, it's, it's, it's convenient, but it's dangerous and it's not, uh, it's not conducive to uh, safe driving habits. Also, you're going to see a VMS board for the next two weeks as you come into the key, um, advising people once again uh, that, you know, it's the law to stop for pedestrians. Uh, you're also going to see heavy police enforcement. Uh, in fact, we're uh, also using decoys to get our point across. It's just we've been educating for a long time. This law has been in effect for a long time. And sometimes the only way to really get your point across is to use enforcement. Um, and, and so we're doing all of those things, but uh, we should be seeing uh, some shovels in two weeks. We're very thrilled. Tony's been working hard trying to get the county to approve these things, which has been no easy task, I can assure you. Thank you very much. Thank we you. appreciate your efforts. Yes, uh, Mr. Kaplan. Just last thought on this. It's galling to me always to remember that our small government, state government um, preempts regulation on texting while driving. We've had our signage up, which I hope has made a positive difference since that young man was, was, uh, was killed in a bike accident uh, some time ago. I hope that makes a difference. But we can't do yeah. anything about texting while driving ourselves while this law is in effect. Is there a law against texting while driving? There's a preemption. A, there's ordinance. a preemption, but we cannot control it. I think that, at this I think well, it's a that the secondary offense. adopted was secondary. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Right. Excuse me, explain that. If you're pulled over for another offense and you're determined to have been texting while driving, that is a what they Not the say. primary offense. Okay. Right. Thank you. Our next item, please. Next item. Current status of the Key Biscayne Police Department traffic squad, Councilmember Holloway. So I I was unaware that um, we would be discussing the lights uh, in the crosswalk. So I'm, um, I added this because, you know, this isn't new. We've, we've been discussing this for four years. Um, and I distinctly remember uh, a great presentation three years ago about the Key Biscayne Police Department traffic squad. We, uh, middle of the year, uh, and, decided to add two, two officers. Uh, there was a commitment to having four officers collecting data, enforcement, being more proactive, and this feels extremely reactive. So I'm hoping that the, I know, I, I know the officers are still out there. I have yet to see the data suggesting that our enforcements are preemptive measures are working. I believe they are because I, I see it myself. Um, but unfortunately, I get the sense that it's, I, I know that these things happen out of reaction. We're, I, I, I guess I, the convert, the alternative to having the, the crosswalks is, well, then maybe we don't need those two extra officers. I mean, I, I, I support you wholeheartedly. But I have asked numerous times, do you need more officers? What do you need? And 
I'm ready to say, well, if we want to go strictly to a digital format, something where it's flashing lights, human, and we don't need officers at certain interact intersections, we're reducing the number of crosswalks, so we're becoming more, we're encouraging more driving, reducing the amount of pedestrian friendliness that we so wholeheartedly appreciate about living here. It, it just feels very contradictory, and it's, it's, if you can't tell, I'm frustrated because this isn't new. This has been going on. I've been asking for three years for data, for support, for what do you need? More officers so that we don't have traffic lights throughout the entire causeway. Well, we do collect data, and uh, I apologize if I haven't been forwarding that to you, but I'm going to share some of that with you tonight. Um, first of all, in, in law enforcement in particular, we are very crisis management oriented. We always have programs that are proactive. However, shifts in certain situations can take away from program A to put into program B. And for instance, in 2013, when we had a dedicated, all they did was traffic enforcement. They were not a support group. They did not uh, join the other squad in, in those squad activities. Um, we wrote, um, let's see, we wrote 1,600 moving citations in the village. The next year, 2014, when we had a spike in crime, a sizable spike in crime on the midnight shift, and we realized that having three to four cops out there simply wasn't enough. We had to take some of our traffic squads, incorporate them into daily squads, deplete some of those daily squads, moving some of our personnel up to midnight shift, to deal with what was a considerable spike in crime. I think that was the year when the famous video of the little kid walking around with the gun in his hand, uh, and we were getting the gang kids coming over here. Well, we arrested that spike in crime. However, we realized that it's important to have enough cops here on a squad at night so that we can create a safe living environment so we incorporated the traffic officers into the squads on day shift. So they go out there and their job is to do traffic. However, if we get a call for service and we have to use them for a call for service, if we have to man traffic light intersections, if we have to do um, pedestrian crossing for our schools before and after, our, our school guard crossing when we don't have a substantial enough uh, amount of school guards, then we have to use that resource. Now, I could tell you that I am coming to you this year, and I am going to talk about and use some of these numbers to talk about having a dedicated unit similar to having a dedicated Marine Patrol. Now, on, uh, on weekends, you're going to see two boats out every weekend, forever and ever. We have a safety issue out there. We have a traffic issue out there. So we do have cops who work mostly traffic, but they don't act as standalone traffic guys. They incorporate in everything else we try to do. So I'm going to be coming to the council to talk about increasing uh, my, my police presence. It's, it's never been a popular subject, okay? to keep increasing the number of our personnel and growing the size of our government. But I can't just speculate on working a year or two years worth of statistics and come up here and justify anything. When we increased our boat presence out there, it was after a number of years of, of battles on the water, so to speak, where we could finally justify with a, a proven increase in issues that a second boat would have a profound effect. And by the way, we have done a tremendous job reducing the amount of injuries and fights that have occurred out on the water out there, and I'm really proud of our folks. I know that we could do a better job with traffic if we went back to having 
guys doing nothing but traffic. So we're incorporating that in our request to council, and you'll see that in June. Um, I already broached this subject with the manager when we had our preliminary meeting, and he's very well of why I'm bringing it. And then it'll be up to council to make that determination if they need it. However, everything that I do here is a total incorporation of every issue we have on the key. And that is driven by statistics and by things that occur here. And I will react and I will continue to react with trends as they occur um, and, and take from Peter to pay Paul because I'm a small police department. And I have to tell you, with, without sounding like a knucklehead, um, we do a lot with a little. And we wear multiple hats. And we have cops who do traffic, marine patrol, dive team, investigations. They wear all those hats. And so depending on the day, whether it's a weekend, whether it's a weekday, whether it's this, that, or the other, Chuck Press might be today Marine Patrol because it's a, a Saturday. Tomorrow I might be back on my motorcycle doing traffic during the week. Um, it, it, it depends on where we could plug these people in. Now, obviously, if I had 20 more guys, and I know Ed doesn't want to hear this, and I could appreciate that. Everybody, <laughs> everybody has it. I'm not saying that without anything but no respect. No problem, Chuck. We all have our opinions on what we do. You know do. where I'm coming from. Um, CEOs always could use more people. But it's got to be something that the entire community agrees they want to do and support because you're not just talking about doing it for a year. You're talking about moving on and keeping this level of service the way it is. I could tell you I'm down three cops right now. I'm short three cops. They all left to Broward Sheriff's for bigger and better things. Pensions, opportunities, things like that. Three real good aggressive young cops. Chief, um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, maybe I misunderstand, but I, I'm not sure that he's suggesting that that we don't have enough police presence. I think I, I, I'm very happy with the job you're doing, and I'm very no, happy. No, he, he wasn't saying I think he wants, not. he wants data. He wants to show what's happening, and he wants to study, and he wants the, the things that were promised and I in told the past. Him that's my fault, and I'll get that for him. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure okay. that, that, that that anybody here is pushing for more police. I, I mean, I'm not. I, I well, uh, if, if the solution, if, if the debate is that we put flashing lights on every crosswalk, or as the opposed else, to, as opposed to what, I need a number. How many, how many officers would it take to properly enforce so that we don't have to keep robbing Peter Two years, change this, change that to pay Paul. What? Why is it that we're taking a? What I what I view is it, there's an expense to those lights. It, it it comes out of the beauty of living on an much island. Much more expensive Absolutely. than a police officer. Much more expensive. Theo, I agree with you, and, and we were trying not to do the flashing lights because of the what people right. have expressed as light pollution. And to Frank's point but. earlier. We ha we're abandoning what I believe is a potential solution way prematurely. Frank was pointing out with regards to the, the fields that we didn't give it enough of a chance. And quite frankly, I don't remember having a vote on the lights at, at that intersection. So I'm, I'm frustrated because we're essentially abandoning the possibility at this point of enforcing and educating a population over a decade. I acknowledged up front this is not a one-year solution. You this said is a long-term comprehensive solution that I have yet to see. So you'd like to see really okay, boots on the ground enforcement yes, and, and, and on a regular basis? not a reactive. We have to teach an entire population when there is a crosswalk how you treat it. And unfortunately, I lived in a community. Most of America reacts to crosswalks in a very different way. I, I, we are I, unique I, in the sense that somehow it hasn't met the culture of South Florida yet. And I, I, I appreciate your, your, your opinion. I, I, I do think that this is, should be something that we should hear the chief talk and stuff and, and vote on because I, 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 I think the police department here does a great job and, and I think we've learned over time that we're not going to fix our traffic problems with more police officers or more lights. We just have to have less cars, you know, and, 
And um, you know, I think we're doing a good job. I think the the only thing that I that I that, that I suggested is that we study the which of the intersections you really want to signage, to put signage on, and then take off the signs of the other ones that you're not going that, to. That, that's what we're currently And, and, what, and I, eliminate and, crosswalks. Well, well that's, that's I, I don't, absurd. I don't know, I don't the idea know, of I, I don't know living in a community where you can't cross the street because, it, oh, it's not convenient and therefore it's not but, safe and doesn't have an, an existing light? But that's not Just what we have here. The hallway with, with not what all we have due here. respect, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you my opinion on that. It is absurd. It's also absurd that grown-ups are texting and driving, and it's killing more people in this country than DUI is now. It's overtaken DUI for the number of deaths it's associated with, and it's growing by the minute, and nothing is changing. So if those things, those theoretical wishes that people would get it, and that people would start learning, and that we could educate, you can but you can only educate by using all of the tools that you have available to you. I could tell you that these are the only two intersections that are gonna have flashing lights. But if you go down Cran and you approach Heather and those lights flash, people stop. If you go to any other intersection, and now that I'm a temporary resident of the Key, I see it every minute of the day. People don't give a damn, they don't Stop. They don't know. Somebody can. Yes, they, don't they do. Know. I no, they don't. They, they're from other countries. They're, they they don't, don't know because we're not teaching them. We are. We've put. We've sat. I've sat at intersections with my yeah, cops. reactionary. If Where's the proactive? No, 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 no. I'm sorry. We give pamphlets. We educate. I've done programs in the newspaper to try and educate. We put <laughs> VMS signs. How much education can you do until you have to go hardcore? Hardcore, hard, this is an abandonment. This isn't hardcore. This is not an hardcore abandonment. Hardcore is a year long, 20 hard. officers. You tell me how many officers it would take to replace these lights. Well, we got to vote on this. I understand. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm giving you <laughs> right. once. You weren't here. Four years ago, we voted on adding two more officers. Well, we and did, I, did. I, if it's an incremental progression, so be it. But the unfortunate thing is we did this debate and we added officers and yet we're now abandoning that as a prospect. I disagree. I, 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 With all due respect. Mr. Gross. I have a suggestion. <laughs> I think that it's incumbent upon us, with input from the community, to tell our chief what we want our police department to be, what we want it to do, and then he will tell us what he needs in order to do that. Because we're talking out of both sides of our mouth. Parking is a huge problem. Do we want to stop all of the people that are coming here to work every day and take up all our parking around the perimeter of the village green? Do we want to free up parking spaces for our residents that really have the right to use those? Maybe we need some meter maids or people enforcing parking rules. Do we want to educate people? Give them $300 tickets. <laughs> That'll educate them really quick. Program. What do we want our police department to do and what do we want them to be? Because I've seen, and I've talked to Chief Press about, why can't we get cops out there directing traffic during the worst, heaviest traffic all day, uh, all week long, coming and going? And when those people are out there directing traffic, I don't mean flipping lights on and off. I mean directing traffic like they have been. It helps. It helps a lot. And I don't know what these smart lights are going to be or that what they're not going to be, but to me, the smartest light is a well-trained traffic cop out there directing traffic. He's got eyes, he's got a brain, he can see what's going on, he can hear what's going on. So we need to tell not only Chief Press, but our other department leaders, what do we want them to be? And they will tell us what they need to be that. Because this conversation could go on forever, and there's not really any communication going on. So I suggest if we have workshops, that's one of the workshops maybe we ought, ought to have. Well, and I think just to be clear, we've had this discussion. There's not always consensus from the council as to what the direction is. Well, maybe it's something we yeah, vote on. I think, yeah, we need that, to vote on it. Maybe it's something we vote on. So, so that's... One, one element that I, I wanted to suggest, um, a translation from Theo's remarks, which echo from earlier conversations on the same point, we had 
a degree of consensus, I believe, on the need to be effective in pedestrian safety. Yes. Whatever it takes to be effective in creating pedestrian safety. And ideally, that thing, that solution, whether it's lights or cops or a combination, would not adversely affect the pedestrian quality of the community, the quality of life of the community. So I, I'm guessing that part of the reaction is the notion of eliminating crosswalks, which is absurd. Um, so I think that what I'd like to suggest is while we're thinking about, or you're thinking about what physical retrofits or physical improvements are required to make pedestrian safety better, we keep in mind the pedestrian quality of the community that we're trying to protect in the first place. I think we had, now, the, the consensus, I remember very specifically, was on a certain methodology of lights at the airport. For whatever reason, we found that we couldn't get that approved, as, as preposterous as that sounds. And they didn't as approve it. Right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Next Do we need item? anything from, from, from Dade County? Do we need anything from them? <laughs> it's a rhetorical question. No, I didn't. I think we're done. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Next item, consensus of council to support Miami-Dade County's proposal to ban styrofoam from parks, recreation areas, beaches, and marinas. Mayor Lindsay. Well, Mr. Dela Cruz, evidently Miami-Dade needs something from us. And uh, they've reached and, and out to. And that's the way we should co cooperate. And, and so that's why this is on, this, uh, on the item. Uh, Miami-Dade reached out. They would like all municipalities to support their proposal to ban styrofoam at parks, recreational areas, beaches, and marinas. And as you know, we did this years ago, thanks to Mr. Holloway, and we were able to pass our ordinance. We were not preempted by the state because we did it. Um, and we, we were pretty uh, progressive in doing it, thanks to your leadership. And Miami-Dade did not take action. Uh, I, and now they realize that, you know, uh, we're all well-educated as to what Styrofoam does uh, to, to the bay and, and animals and, and, and at parks and what have you uh, with our wildlife and, and just ecologically how it's not sound. So they have found that or they believe that because it is limited to marinas and parks and, and not countywide that they still have the authority to do so and they would like our support. So I'd like to get support from council, consensus from council to support Miami-Dade in their uh, proposal to ban styrofoam. I think that's a no-brainer. There you go. Need to discuss it with you. Do we, yes. do we have any comments? And I think we should go further. I think that, that, that our community should be in the forefront of, of banning as much of the, of the bad stuff as we oh, possibly we can. can. And I think we should study that, and I, should, I think we should, we should. You know, and I, 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 again, Theo has been a, an advocate. He, he advocated for styrofoam. Hopefully he'll bring Very effective. To that because he tried to do it. plastic bags. You raised it a couple of times. Unfortunately, that was preempted by the state. Um, I know that there are a lot of residents who are incredibly interested in banning plastic bags. Whether we would, as a community, like to do it voluntarily, um, that's the discussion because, uh, you know, we can, I, I know that there's consensus from our, our residents. I think the merchants are on the fence, but maybe with a little uh, discussion, good, healthy community discussion, we could be the model of doing it voluntarily. I think we should be. Um, you know. let's, let's, let's bring that. that we, should, we had a good discussion on it we last did. year. Let's bring it let's back. Let's add that. And let's do this. Yep. Let's do this. We will be uh, contacting Miami-Dade about that. Thank you for your support. Next item, Schwartz Media. Council Member Lendon. I'd like to cons everybody consider terminating our contract with Schwartz Media for Public Relations. We're spending excuse me, $96,000 a year, and at this point in time, I don't think it's necessary, I don't think it's beneficial, and I don't think it does us any good. It's just a waste of money, and that's how I feel about it. Uh, we got it originally because we wanted the city of Miami and Dade County to think we weren't just the rich kids living in Key Biscayne trying to ban the boat show and uh, to get a good image, and I don't think it did a damn thing for us, and uh, 
I'm sure they're a great firm. They, they do the tennis thing. And, but I don't think we need them, and I think it's a waste of money. So I'm making a proposal, resolution, whatever you like to call, to uh, terminate their contract uh, when it expires. I, I'm not sure that we can do that in this item. We'd have to bring it up in the next meeting. Sorry? I think you, I think you have to bring it. He's trying to do a motion. Well, why, don't, why don't, point taken, why don't we bring it back so that we have time to let's, absorb let's, this? Let's, let's definitely look into it for sure. I mean, you know, I think it's... Uh, they gave you. They gave you a meeting before, a uh, dog and pony show about all the things they've done for you up until date. So you basically have but reconsider again. Fine, but they have presented what they've done for you. No, I'm wondering, past. can we take a vote on this? We it wasn't on the agenda before the meeting this time. So can we well, this, 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 consider a motion? I don't think, I, I think that I mean, we have to look at their contract first of all. If you were to do it anyways tonight, you couldn't terminate it. No, I'm saying whenever the contract permitted, I don't know if it's right. three months, six months, um, whenever the contract I think expired. that obviously if there's a consensus of counsel, we can, the manager can look into it. He may have the authority to terminate anyways under the agreement. Um, we can look at it. Uh, so I think if, you know, there is a consensus of the council, then um, the manager can move forward. Mr. Dela Cruz, are, are we using them for for anything other than the boat show? Uh, you know, uh, we've been using them. Yes, yes, we have been using them. They actually worked on on the dog park. They've worked on uh, issues with our sister city and 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 illuminating what we've done with sister city. They've worked on damage control for cyclist incidents. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have the list with me. I'm trying to talk off the top of my head. Um, they've gotten us involved with climate change and what we're doing in terms of our zoning and our policy to stay ahead of the game. Um, Can't we have them on, like John has the engineers that whenever he needs them for something, he can call on them and, and give them a, a project as opposed to keeping them on a retainer? Well, and I'm sure we could do all sorts of things. I don't know that they would do it, but I'm sure other people well, I mean, would. I'm but sure I have to tell find you. somebody that would do it, uh, you know. I, they were here a couple of weeks ago. They made a presentation. They reduced to their price, and we gave them instructions on what to, we gave them. Um, Kind of marching orders of what they needed to do. So, uh, just I'm wanted. Sure that we, I'm not sure that we uh, we considered it at that time. I, th I think that 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 was a. I wasn't expecting that presentation. So, I mean, I, uh, it's good to hear what they what they've been doing and such. But I mean, if, if we're going to consider what, well, what they're going to be doing for us on a on an ongoing basis, I think we need to we need to vote on it. You know. I yes, Mr. Kaplan. I um, I don't want to make a decision on this tonight. Fair enough. I want to make a decision on it sometime, and I'm happy that you brought it up. It's something that we should digest and consider. I would, I listened in and I heard much of their presentation, and you've heard me say in the past, uh, and I may be in the minority of one on this. I I don't love their content. I don't. Uh, I, I, I sometimes, and maybe even more than sometimes, maybe frequently, quibble about the message um, for various reasons, but I, I think that they try to do some ulterior purpose salesmanship on us in a way that, you know, the key is a welcoming venue and other elements that they sort of feather into their messaging that I think can, can as I read it, and think about it critically, debase the message. If it's strategic, if it's, if it's tactical about the boat show and what a poor steward the city of Miami is, I will sometimes find elements that weaken that message in how they, in how they present. And I've said that in the past, and I'm not sure that, I've, uh, that others think the same, but I would, I would, I, I think that there is a good purpose to having PR. They have helped us, in my opinion, despite what I just said, and they I think. Changed the, the, they really changed the, the conversation in terms of how we were perceived. Um, and, I mean, we all did that, but they, they kind of led the charge. We don't have the in-house expertise, and I'm just saying the PR worked for us very, very well, whether it's them or someone else. It's something that was incredibly helpful 
and we are perceived in a very different manner and we're perceived as um, good stewards of, of, of conscientious growth of, of um, the environment of, oh, I am, I am. Louise? And I think to go, you know, I, I just think that's something that is important right now. I agree that it is important to do it well, to do it as well as we can. I don't think that we can muster our PR machine internally and ad hoc. Some, sometimes we do an excellent job, and in fact, I think sometimes we do a better job than Schwartz can possibly do because we're authentic and we know our story and we, when we do a good job at it, I think it can be great. But we can't rely on that as a regular proposition, I think. And I, Luis's proposition of having them on kind of standby, you know, is something that we've, we've considered. Whether they do it or not, and whether it would work, um, uh, you know, timeliness-wise, as we need it, they would be responsive when they're not on retainer, I don't know. I think they probably would because they're pros. But I'd like to consider it. I think it's a worthwhile, it's a worthwhile item. Well, let's put it on the agenda. Fine. For the oh. June 28th uh, meeting. Will you be out of town? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you do the other meeting? I will be I, out of town. I have a suggestion. Yes. We're going to put that on the agenda. Um, similar to what I mentioned earlier about um, giving some direction as far as what we want our police department to be and if we want to do the kind of things Theo was talking about and so on, and we're, getting, and we're told we need certain personnel to do it. Same thing with, the, with our PR firm. We were very heavy users last year, and I think they did do a good job for us in, in certain respects, but we aren't probably going to be the, as heavy a user this year. We should decide what we want the PR firm to do, and then, and then we should asking. base what we pay them upon uh, on what we believe we want them to do. And if they can't do it, then there are other firms out there that can. But, Gary, but, that's very sensible. I completely agree. So again, it's, it's us leading the charge and somebody implementing it. So how do we get to that point? Do we want to discuss that at the next meeting? Sure. Okay. I, th Great. I think that's part of the yep. discussion. I think that's, yep. Next item, City of Miami litigation, Councilmember London. We've been litigating, I guess, for over a year. We spent over $900,000 so far. We definitely demonstrated to the City of Miami, Dade County, the National Marine Manufacturers Association, and God knows who else that we're serious. They know we're serious. They know we don't mind spending money on attorneys. We've selected excellent attorneys. Um, we've had mixed results so far. And, but I think now is the time to push for mediation, for arbitration, not formal, informal, between whether it be the manager, the mayor, whatever, and those people to try to see if there's some common ground we can work out at this point in time rather than keep on litigating, spending money, and dragging on ad infinitum because it'll just be a bottomless pit because we now have had the boat show. We're probably going to have another boat show. We're probably going to have a number of things which we don't particularly like, but I don't know if we're going to have anything to do about it. We might not have the flex park. We might have the flex park, but I think now is the time, and I think it's time is opportune. We might not, not have another opportunity in the future to get together with them and try and work something out without the attorneys. So I would suspend any future. Obviously, things are pending. They'll, they'll be pending. But I'm saying right now, I would think that if we can may approach these people to see if there's some common ground that we can work at individually rather than with attorneys, that I think now is the time to do it. And uh, I know that a number of you people prefer to sue and hire attorneys, but I, in my experience, the only people who really do well are the attorneys. Thank you, Mr. London. Well, so um, I'm calling for basically anybody support me in suspending the thing or just want to keep on using attorneys, spending lots of money, and uh, going in ad finitum. Are you making motion? That's my motion. Do I have a second? But can, can we, I'm not sure, um, can we make motions on agenda items that have not been uh, Well, this is not, not for action. No. Right, so uh, you have to put that on the agenda. Well, then for again, this will go on the June 28th, and I'll 
June, let's see if we make it the June 14th, I won't be here. So make it the June 20th. Works better. But, but that doesn't mean that we can't talk, you know, talk towards. We can discuss it. Yeah. I, I think that we're so walking a fine line. We have executive sessions. We talk about what the direction is, what the policy is. And I, I just think there's a reason why we're going forward. I don't think this is the right venue. I think it is um, careless. And I would love to speak to this at an executive session. That we have a, a duty to our uh, to our uh, constituents. We have um, th that's just the right form. This is not, unfortunately. I understand your frustration, but I think we would be um, negligent by discussing it now. That's my view. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I'd like to speak to our attorney about that and, and, and see what you know what 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 he suggests, um, because uh, I mean I've made my position. More I understand, and again clear. I will repeat: it is negligent, it is inappropriate to speak now. Um, so let's consider that and. We will go ahead and have an executive session. Are you asking me to shut up on the matter? Yes, that, okay. I am. That's what she's telling In a very nice way. <laughs> Truly with respect. Okay. <laughs> Next item, um, under the village manager's report, police vehicle allocation, Mr. Manager. Yes, if I may, um, Council Member Gross has had a couple of conversations with me about the allocation of uh, the police vehicles, and he is new to this, and we will be presenting programs during the budget workshop, so I thought it was apropos on his request to have Chief Press come up here and kind of explain his police vehicle allocation and what they see from time to time. And the rebuttal from Mr. London. And, I, <laughs> and I'm representing your position, correct, sir? Uh, you are, with one, with, Please. With one um, explanation. There, there, there seems to be some line of thinking that because there are so many cars parked in the lot at the same time from time to time during the day that we must have too many cars or too many cops. I don't personally believe that that's the case, but I think that it should be explained so that maybe we can put that discussion to bed a little bit. Sure, certainly. Um, I kind of created a list of things because I didn't want to miss anything. And I know I could do this on the top of my head, but I'd be remiss if I missed anything. First, let's talk about roll calls. We have roll calls twice a day, in the morning uh, and in the evening, 7 a.m., 7 p.m. The officers now, just for instance, uh, the outgoing shift now has to come in early to take their body cameras to download them into the cloud so that that camera and that video is downloaded. So the officers are probably coming in, I want to say, about 30 minutes beforehand sporadically to download their cameras so we have that information in and turn those cameras in because the cameras stay here. They don't go home. Then you have your actual roll calls. Your roll calls can last five minutes. They can last 30 minutes or an hour, depending on whether we're doing in-service training or whether we have a lot of information to disseminate. If we have a big weekend coming up and we discuss the operations plan of, let's say, Memorial Day weekend when the crew that's on for those three days will be working. So they may be sitting in that parking lot for an hour, hour and 15 minutes. But just so that you understand, we always have a car out on the road in the event we need an immediate response. But you'll see two shifts in there at the same time because the outgoing shift dealing with their cameras, turning in their, uh, their radar guns, their noise meters, et cetera, and then you have the other shift that's coming in, getting ready to go to work, having their roll call, and then going out on the street. During the day, during the night, we respond to the station for walk-in reports, golf cart registrations. The guys, 99% of the men and women, eat their meals inside of the police station. They bring their meals. So those cars will be there for that. They'll be there for arrests. We do red light camera reviews where we meet citizens at the station and we go over the red light camera <coughs> issues with them. Our detective does his case follow-up when he's not out on the street. His car will be there 
a great majority of the day as he's pounding out reports and, and doing his follow-up. Our DARE officer has her vehicle there a lot of times when she's done with her work at the schools. She has to do her lesson plans, et cetera, for, uh, for the coming days and, and for the next week. Uh, we have two spare vehicles only, okay? And they will always be in the lot in the event that something goes wrong with one of our cars that we have to shop it for a um, uh, uh, maintenance or something like that. We do uh, some steady maintenance work on our vehicles. Uh, we have staff vehicles in here. Our lieutenant's cars are in here often. The lieutenants have a multitude of things that they have to get done in the station. They're doing special event planning. They're reviewing stats uh, that the officers turn in. They're discussing issues that I bring to the table constantly that I have to have them do. Um, things of that nature and, and multiple planning. Um, we do in-service training during the day with our cops because we can't afford to always pay overtime for our in-service training. So the things that we need to do, we'll bring in a couple cops at a time. You'll see those cars in the parking lot. Um, we are currently uh, three officers short and just happened to have those cars in the lot last week because we did PMs on those cars. We sent them to Miami Beach, did the PMs to keep them in operating uh, standards, and now they're, they're off-site. Um, so, you know, do we have an excess number of cars? No, we have a car per period. And those cops are in and out. But I can tell you this, they have laptops. They do their reports out in the street. They do 18,000 directed patrols a year. They're out in the street but they're here for 12 hours, and there are times when they have to come in. They cannot arbitrarily just come into the station. They have to advise their supervisor as to why, unless they're literally uh, generated by the dispatcher to come in to handle a number of things that they do. And I know that there is the appearance that there's cars in there, but I can assure you that those cars in there don't have cops sleeping in the station. They're not just hanging out. Um, there are things going on and there are rhymes and reasons for everything that we do. And I could tell you this, especially more than anything, during daytime when we have the majority of our cops, we got Marine Patrol, we've got DARE, we've got detectives, we got staff, I can assure you they know that I'm here or they know that Deputy Chief Eunice is here and they're not coming in to screw around. Um, so. Uh, the appearance may be that we just have cars sitting around. It's it's anything but that. Do you have a GP, that GPS system that you had? In every one of the cars. So you know where all your... I could tell you whether that car has a brain. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I could tell you where they go, how fast they go, uh, how they travel, how long those cars sit, how long it's been since they started, when they started them, it's probably the most dynamic uh, informational piece of, of that cop and his workplace that we have. So it sounds like from that explanation that it would, and rather than being unusual for so many cars to be in the lot at the same time, it would be pretty unusual for there not to be a few cars in the lot at the same time, most of the time, from that I, explanation. It, it's it, it just the dynamic of keep us cane and that there's a lot of stuff that goes on inside of, of this station and and people come here uh, there's there's an interesting thing that happens here a lot of people don't want us going to their house to do a report a lot of people feel more comfortable coming here uh, we offer the service of going to your house to check your golf cart and register it people want to come here to do that just call us. We offer that service. Same with bicycle registrations, things like that. Now, we've civilianized a lot of those, and we'll have some of the civilians do those. But the golf carts, anything that's out on the street, anything that's something that we have to pay a lot of attention to, the cops do it. And, Chief, just a suggestion. I'm sorry it's not. Um, um, Please. Um, residents have asked if you could have almost scheduled hours for getting your golf carts um, inspected so instead of having it ad hoc on call 
people would like, you know, it would be easier for planning. If it would be Tuesdays at 9 a.m. or whatever. Planning for them? For them. Is that what you're referring yep. to? Well, I, I appreciate that explanation, Chief Press. And I the reason I wanted you to make it is because I'm tired of hearing the same thing over and over again from people commenting on the number of cars in the lot when I didn't know the detail of why they're there, but I was pretty sure that they were there for a reason. And I think. That was a good explanation, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Thank you. <coughs> Do I have a motion to, ad to adjourn Move. the meeting? Second. Second. Meeting is adjourned. Meeting adjourned.